Well, if you've just bought a micro, you're probably loading and saving programs on cassette tape, something like this. However, to get at a particular piece of information, you have to run through the tape in sequence until you find it, and this can take an awful long time. Now, there are some ways of speeding up this process, and one of them is by using what are called floopies. That's one of these, and if I open it carefully, you'll be able to see inside what it is. And all it is is a loop of tape placed in this cartridge, and this enables it to be driven across the reading heads very much faster than the tr a traditional cassette. In fact, it operates at about ten times the speed of an ordinary cassette, but it's still sequential, so it runs one after the other. And if you want to load programs quickly or reach data, you need a storage medium which gives you what's known as random access. That's the techie term for today. Well, the most common of these is the floppy disk, and I'm sure many of you have seen things like this. This is a three and a half inch disk, five inch disk and an 8 inch disk and they hold from a hundred thousand to well over a million characters. If we open one and I don't recommend you do this you'll see why they're called floppies and obviously the information is held magnetically on the surface of this floppy disk and it's accessed as it's spun round. It looks a bit like a gramophone record and in fact the analogy works quite well. How do you find that information? Well gramophone record has a catalogue in the middle and if you look here track four barber adagio for strings and if you want to play that you simply take the head one two three four place it on there and somewhere you get adagio for strings well a disc actually works in rather a similar way except the catalogue is stored on one of the tracks of the disc like this and that has an address of which track the head should go to and then as the disc turns around which sector your data is stored in or which data which sector the data starts and then you read it in. So any serious computer user will soon turn to disks, but they do have their problems. Don't say a word, but we've been hearing rumours of corruption on the tube trains. Not that London transport staff have been taking bribes, no. It's all to do with these floppy disks. Now, floppy disks are a marvellous way of storing computer data, but they do need careful handling. And there are some dire warnings on the packet. They advise you here not to touch, not to bend, not to heat or freeze, and above all, to avoid magnets. Oh, excuse me, I think it's my train. So what am I doing on a London tube train? Well, some people say that the magnetic fields generated by the powerful electric motors can corrupt disks. That is, they can damage the data that you've probably spent four days typing in. We wondered whether this was true and whether there are other ways that you can accidentally damage disks. We decided to investigate by using seven identical disks onto which we've recorded a sequence of programs. Now this is disk number one and in order to give it maximum exposure I'm going to put it as close to the track as possible. We left disc number two in the BBC canteen freezer for 24 hours. That's well below the minimum temperature recommended. A disc left near the screen of a TV or monitor can easily be damaged because of the large magnetic field that's induced around the tube when the set's switched on. So I'll switch this one on and off a couple more times for good measure. Yeah. And that's disc number three. Oh, a couple of other tips. It's not wise to switch the system off with a disc left in the drive and also never write on the label of the disc with a biro. We were also wondering whether the strong magnet in a loud speaker coil could damage discs, so we have subjected disc number four to five hours of non-stop Barry Manilow at full volume. probably his agent. It's not so obvious that the bells in a telephone create a large magnetic field, so we have left disc number five under here for the last few days, and I'll add that to the collection. London Airport? Yeah. 
now for test number six, these airport x-ray machines. Years ago, these machines would use a powerful continuous x-ray beam, which would literally cook your holiday films just like that. Now, some airports, Malta for example, still use them, so be warned. But these more modern machines, they simply take an x-ray snapshot of your bag. Bye. The x-ray generator is activated for a fraction of a second. And don't be fooled that you can't see the floppy disk on the monitor. It is there, but it's not dense enough to register. Now, the manufacturers of this machine are so confident that it won't corrupt disks that they've agreed to run disk number six through the machine 1,000 times. Disc number seven. Oh. <laughs> and this is the very disc that went on that pub crawl. It has since been washed under the cold tap and allowed to dry. So I'll just load it and see what I'll sort of state it's in. Are you placing your bets, Mac? I am. Well, let's have a look and see. Look at that. Not even a hiccup after all that beer. Well, it couldn't have been Heineken. Yes, that would have reached everywhere. I know what you're trying to say. <laughs> Do you know, that is surprising, because that means that six out of the seven discs that we used and abused on that film were undamaged. The only one that was affected was disc number five, the one that was left under the telephone. Well, I'll try and load it, and uh, you'll see what happens. I think that... Uh, Mr. Manilow's agent has put the fluence on this one. But it's a shame because leaving a disc under a phone is actually quite an easy mistake to make. And look at that, there's no doubt about the results. Disc fault. Still, at least in this case, we do know why that happened. Sometimes you can be as careful as you like with your disc. No phones, fridges, beers, trains, anything like that. And you still get a disc fault. And as Murphy's Law would have it, it'll be a fault on an invaluable program, the very one that you can't afford to lose. Now, obviously a backup disc is a must, providing you don't go and do what we did and leave them both in the same box. But Graham, apart from good housekeeping advice, is there any way that you can actually recover material that, that's gone on a damaged disc? Fortunately there is. There's various routines for various machines, but if you've got a BBC, mm -hmm. there's an excellent package, Disc Doctor. Disc Doctor. What is it? Okay, it's a ROM-based package to you and me. It's a chip you put in the machine. Mm -hmm. You access it via the keyboard, yeah. and you can disassemble and put information back on the disc and repair it. Right. Is it easy to use? Um, it's not really for the absolute beginner. You need to know a bit about the hierarchy of discs and what you're doing. Yeah. A program could take, you know, quite several hours to recover. So a bit of know-how and a disc doctor, yeah. you'd be all right. What's the commonest problem with discs? Actually, it's not the discs, it's the disc drive. What, you mean even a, even a brand new disc drive? Would you have a problem 40 with it? 40% of disc drives imported happen to have the mechanical alignment not set up. They're not calibrated. That's amazing. Well, this is a disc drive, a, a naked disc drive, without its clothes <laughs> on, correct, so right. to speak. You probably, look at it. you probably recognise it from the front. Um, the standard disc drive, it's quite a complex piece of mechanical hardware. Mm. Very basically, though, there's three things you need to concern yourself. There's the head, mm -hmm. moves in and out to read the disc, mm -hmm. and on the other side, that's the plated circuit motor that drives the disc ground. Oh, it's fascinating to see it like that. But let's go back to this business about the manufacturers not feeling inclined to align the disc drives before they send them out on mm. the road. Why? Primarily, it takes an hour's, an hour's time of a skilled engineer, plus quite expensive test equipment to set all the calibration up. So it's just not cost effective? Not really, no. All right, what's your answer? You're looking smart, <laughs> so I know you've got one. Ho, ho. Okay, we've got a program, a computer, that emulates a laboratory. It throws onto the screen this expensive laboratory, and it does it automatically, so it saves engineering time to set them up. So is this rather like sending your car in for one of those electronic services, yes. computerised services? Very much the same, yes. Yeah. And here you can see it running through the test automatically. Mm -hmm. telling you where you should be, what you should be doing, yeah. and you can see the limits of what you And it's diagnosing what might be wrong with that disc Going through a complete test of all the mechanical parameters. It's quick too, isn't it? That was what, 25, 30 seconds? 25, 30 yeah. seconds this takes, and when it's finished it gives a print out of the results. What's that asterisk for? That asterisk there shows that it's failed a particular test. It's failed on rotational speed, mm. so does that mean it's going around too fast or too slow? This one's going too slow, and that arrow tells me that if I want to adjust it, move it to the right. Can you do it now? Easy, yes, okay. 
we're now going to look at that test that it failed at and mm. thrown on the screen is the results. And we'll adjust it to bring that line Simple in. Simple as that. And then you've got a, a visual display of actually what you're doing so you can centre it up. That's now a healthy drive. Yeah. That's actually very impressive. It's a lot of machinery. What does it cost? Uh, the basic kit starts at £1,900 mm. and it's for all the reputable dealers in the, in the UK. Service centres, people selling disk drives, people importing them. Right. You said it. It's a good way for dealers and people in the trade to improve customer services. Graham, thank you very much. Thank you. Matt. I'm still trying to figure out why anybody would want to dump their discs in a barrel of beer. There must be a good reason.